Okay, uh, yeah, um, uh, uh, good afternoon. It's um, an honor and a pleasure to be here at uh, PyCon Thailand. Um, and yeah, I'm going to be talking about something I call training the most important model. Um, but I suppose before I do that, oh, wait a second here, this is not working. Uh, before I do that, um, um, a little bit about me. I've been doing Python since 2001. Uh, it was in 2001. I went to a workshop by somebody I had never heard of before. His name was Guido Van Rossum, and I spent a day at Linux World in San Francisco uh, learning Python from this man, and that turned out to probably, you could say, change my life. Uh, and um, I have been involved in um, PyCon US since 2003, which was the first year that it was given. Uh, I've also worked for, with um, PyCons in um, the United Kingdom, in, uh, with EuroPython, um, PyCon in Latin America, various things, so I've, I've done that. Um, I am the author of the Quick Python book, as mentioned. Uh, I will be, when I get back home, working on the fourth edition of that book. So um, probably in less than a year, there will be one that has um, sort of new stuff in it, including this, this wild and crazy AI stuff. And then finally, as mentioned, I was on the uh, Python Software Foundation board for five years, uh, three of those years, I was the chair of the Python Software Foundation. Uh, all of which I, I sort of tell you so that you will maybe think that I have some reason to offer you my opinions. But I want to start by asking you to think about what is the most important thing for coding Python. I mean, mentally, of course, you need a computer, et cetera. But mentally, what is the most important thing you need to know? Uh, is it um, maybe an understanding of the operators and the built-in data types? That's, that's certainly vital. Uh, or maybe it's the Zen of Python and knowing the rules of PEP8. I know people who would tell you it's PEP8. You've got to have PEP8. Maybe it's understanding functions. And there are some people that, that do uh, functional programming in Python. I, I believe we had a talk about that. Um, or maybe it's classes and object-oriented programming. I, I certainly know I have met people who think that they can't really be uh, advanced Python programmers unless they, they make many, many classes. So um, you know that, that's another option. Maybe it's the standard library. We're very proud of the fact that Python comes with batteries included. Standard library, those are the batteries. Is that the most important thing? Um, or some people are big fans of virtual environments, understanding those, using those. Um, clearly, clearly an important thing. And I would say that all of those things are definitely important. I'm not, not against any one of those things. Uh, but in my opinion, none of those are what I would say is the most important thing. But in fact, I do have a category for most important thing, and it's related to this word model. Uh, Almost every talk, it seems to me, at this conference has used the word model, talking about AI or, or ML models. Uh, we need to choose the right model. We need to train the model. Uh, model this, model that, model, model, model. Uh, and um, I will have a word or two to say about those models later on, but that's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is, in my mind, the most important thing is having a sound mental model, or maybe it's a set of models, uh, as to how Python works. Uh, and um, let me explain a little bit about what I mean when I say a mental model. Just, just so we're all on the same page. I guess so that we have the correct mental model, mental models, something like that. Um, so 
First of all, when we talk about a model in general, we're referring to something that is a simpler, smaller version of the real thing. Uh, when I was 10 years old, I built a paper mache model of the Saturn V rocket that would, a couple of years later, take men to the moon. I obviously could not comprehend, uh, deal with the big thing, a, a Saturn V rocket, but my little three foot tall model was a way that I could understand at least what it looked like uh, and where the parts were and things like that. So a physical model helps us understand uh, things. Uh, and mental models are the same, except they are, of course, well, mental. They're in our minds rather than a physical object. So to, to explain this, let me give you uh, an example that I like. This is a physical model. This is a picture of an orrery. Uh, the strange name Orrery comes because it was apparently the Earl of Orrery that had one of the first ones made for his amusement. It's a model of the solar system uh, based on you know, the Copernican uh, heliocentric, sun-centric model. If you turn the little crank, the planets go around the sun in a way that you can sort of understand how they work. Uh, obviously, it's much smaller and much simpler than the real thing, but it helped people understand uh, how that worked. Um, and likewise, uh, this is sort of a mental model of the same thing. This is the heliocentric model of the solar system. Uh, again, the planets going around the sun. So it's, it's an understanding uh, rather than the physical model. And again, we like to have mental models because they help us explain how things work. They allow us to reason about processes and objects. They allow us to make predictions about what will happen if we do something with a particular object or system or whatever it is. So, you know, very, very useful. Uh, and if we happen to have an inaccurate or an incomplete mental model, an unsuitable, however you want to call it, uh, then quite often when referring to that, we can't really explain uh, what happens. We sort of get into the realm where, huh, that shouldn't have happened, or oh, that, that seems like magic, what's going on? So that's why we want to have a sound and a correct mental model. For example, this is a mental model of how the solar system works with the Earth in the center. This is, you know, the famous geocentric model. Uh, and it's, it's more complicated than the other one. You can see everything other than the sun and the moon uh, have little epicycles. They do little extra circles as they rotate around to account for retrograde motion. It gets very complicated. Uh, and even even if it sort of kind of works sometimes so that you can see where something is in the sky, uh, you would not want to launch a probe or, heaven forbid, go out in a spacecraft trying to get even to the moon using this mental model. Uh, it, it, it will not work. Your predictions ultimately will not be right. But of course, that didn't stop people from then actually making physical versions of this. This is from uh, El Escorial in Spain. It's an armillary sphere. It is trying to make, somewhere in there, the Earth is in the middle. You can't really even see it through all of the gears and all of the, the various things, uh, trying to, to model this. So um, we don't want to have a faulty mental model. It won't explain things. So let me switch to Python. And what I'm going to do is actually talk about, uh, as an example, uh, one mental model in Python. And I want to talk you through uh, how I think maybe we should approach mental models. So my example here is what is a variable. Now, everybody should, when they first start coding, uh, have run into variables, right? But do you have a clear mental model of what is a variable in Python? 
okay? Can you explain them so that you understand how they work? You can predict what they do. This is one of the most fundamental building blocks we've got. So what is it? What is it? Well, there are a lot of examples I've heard people give when they explain to other people what uh, a, a variable is. And it almost always comes down to something like this. A variable, we say, when we teach people to program, it, it holds a value. Or sometimes people will say, it's a space in memory. Okay, or, or it's a way to store a value, something like this. In other words, what they end up saying suggests a mental model where a variable is a container. It holds something, yes? Uh, it's a quick survey. How many people go along with this? Ooh, okay, okay, here. Uh, be careful with me, I'm Trixie. Uh, so um, the reason that we say this, of course, is, um, you know, as, as was mentioned in this morning's keynote, uh, that C is kind of a dominant language in systems and all sorts of things like that. And it's certainly in a good description of the way that C works. This page is from uh, a uh, university course on C. It's, it's from the, their website. Uh, and you notice that they say right out front, a variable is a location in memory where we can store data values. Uh, they also say in the fine print there, and this is, is the thing that I, I, I've always liked, uh, another way to look at it is a variable is a bucket that can be used to hold something. And they helpfully have a drawing of the X bucket, and we can put the integer 27 into that bucket. Okay. This is absolutely correct as far as, as C is concerned. It's, it, it's a space in memory where you can put stuff. No, no argument at all. Uh, the question is, is that true in Python? Okay. And I'm not, I'm not even wanting to go in to, to the, the details behind the scenes. I'm not going to offer you any disassembly. I'm not going to show you Python's code. Instead, let's do some experiments to see if this mental model actually makes sense. So um, my first set of experiments would be really simple. Uh, let's say we set x equal 2 y equal x, then we change um, x equal to 4, what, what is y, okay? Um, you probably don't have to think a whole lot in order to come up with an answer for that, but I want to go through it using our mental model, okay? So let's use the mental model of containers to predict what happens. X equals two means that we put a two into the X bucket, according to this mental model, yes? And Y equals X, well, traditionally when we look at things where we have a variable uh, on the right-hand side, instead of using the variable, we replace it with its contents. So that would be the same as X equals two, right? Okay. Then we can set X equal to four which means we put a four into our X bucket, right? And so the question we get to is, well, we put a two in X, we put a two in Y, then we put a four in X, what's in uh, Y? Okay, um, not, not a whole huge shock, it should still be two, we haven't changed anything, um, so, Indeed, when you run it in Python, you'll find out that y is equal to 2. Therefore, I must have conclusively proved that variables are containers, are buckets, right? Well, like I said, I'm Trixie. We're not done yet. Let's try another example. Suppose instead of using an integer, we were to use a list, okay? Uh, and, and modify that list. So let's do something like this. We'll say x equals the list one, two, three. Then we'll say 
y equals x. Again, by programming convention, we replace x with its contents. So that must mean y equals 1, 2, 3. Then we change the first element of x from 1 to 4. OK. What is in y is our question. All right. Well, again, using the container model, we would say, OK, we're going to put 1, 2, 3 into the x bucket. No problem. Then we're going to put uh, the contents of x, which is our list 1, 2, 3, into the y bucket. All right. Then we change the first element of x to a 4. All right, what according to this should be the answer? Well, we haven't changed y apparently. So really, what we're saying is uh, we should have um, y still be 1, 2, 3, right? OK, I see some people that might be disagreeing. How many people are going for what y is still 1, 2, 3? Anybody? Like I said, I'm tricksy. Uh, so if you actually run this in Python, of course, you'll see that y is equal to 4, 2, 3. But wait, we didn't change y. We changed x, right? OK, so, so what's going on with that? We apparently have some weird quantum effect, some action at a distance changing both of our buckets. What is this? Whatever it is, it certainly uh, messes up our ability to predict things, no? Uh, this, this whole container bucket thing isn't working very well. So let's say the problem is, with integers, this, this mental model of a bucket predicts what happens. With lists, when we change the element of a list, it doesn't work. This would tell me that my mental model for how variables work is not correct if I can't predict what happens in this situation, right? So maybe there's another way to explain, another mental model that we can use uh, to, to imagine what's going to happen with variables. And in fact, it is that variables are more like labels. They are applied to objects rather than having objects put inside them. So let's, let's see what happens with this. So um, we say x equals 2. That means we have a 2 and we put the label x on it. Uh, I use the little thing that kind of looks like a post-it note. Um, this is, is the way that I always describe this. It's buckets versus post-its in my book. So um, the x goes on there. Then if we say something like y equals x, that has a somewhat different meaning than what it does in the other way of thinking about things. What that means is we're putting a y onto the same thing that the x is on. So we now have two labels on the same object. OK. If then I decide I'm going to say x equals 4, what am I doing? Well, actually, what I'm doing is I'm moving the label from the 2 object to the 4 object. OK. But my y label has stayed on the 2 just as before. So again, I get the right answer with this method. y is still going to be 2. x is now 4. Now, if we do this with a list, um, and I put um, x equals 1, 2, 3, that means I'm putting an x posted, an x label on the list 1, 2, 3. Uh, when I say uh, y equals, well, come on, advance. Uh, when I say y equals x, again, I'm putting the y label on the same object that the x is pointing to. So then, if I decide I'm going to change the first element of the list pointed to by the x variable to 4, uh, it's pretty clear that, yeah, if I try to look at the first element of the list pointed to by the variable y, it's also going to change. So, you know, in effect, 
I have now a correct prediction. My model actually matches reality. I've tested it, I've done an experiment. I can now kind of say, yeah, I think maybe variables are more like labels. They're more like post-its than they are like buckets. So again, as I say, if we have the right mental model, then this result matches it. We can predict, we can reason about what would happen. And that's, that's a good thing, that's a good thing. But I'm not willing to stop there. If we actually think about this mental model for variables a little bit more, there's a little bit more we can get out of it. So by implication, well, let's, let's go ahead and be explicit here. Explicit is better than implicit. Uh, variables are labels that can then be applied to any object. And this means, by the way, that variables don't have types in Python. Objects have types in Python. And I'm, um, you know, I, I, I'm not really trying to go into the whole uh, argument on whether typing is a good thing or a bad thing because, well, it's both. Sometimes it's a good thing, sometimes it's a bad thing. But this is the thing with Python's design. The variables themselves don't naturally in Python have a type. In C, using the container you know, model, they do have a type because you need to have enough space to put the thing. You know, obviously, a, 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 a thousand character string is probably gonna take more space than uh, just an integer or something like that. So you need to actually know the type. In Python, the variables don't care about the type because the objects care about the type. So, you know, I can go ahead and I can put my X post-it on an integer or on a list or on a string. And in terms of just that, that, that way that variables are, it doesn't actually make a whole lot of difference. There's still another thing, though, that goes along with this that I'm not sure people always realize. So let's take this one more step. Uh, variables are labels. They can go on any object. There's one more step that you want to keep in mind. And that is in Python, everything is an object. Okay, not absolutely everything. There are a few things. But in general, everything is an object. By that, I mean data, uh, instances, those things definitely are objects, but so are functions, so are classes, so is the code, so are modules when you load a module, that's an object. All of those things are objects. And if variables can be applied to any object, well, let's just see what that means then. Uh, I can make a function. I know it's a very complicated function, but I assume you follow. And that makes a function object. I can use is instance to say, is this an object? And it says, yes, this is an object. Uh, that means I can, um, well, do you think, there you go. Uh, that means I can use a variable. I can apply a variable to that object. I can use that variable just as I, I could use the object name itself. And that works fine, okay? I can define a class. Okay, this is the, the minimum class that I can make. Uh, and when I do that, I get a class object. I'm not talking about an instance of the class. I'm saying the class itself is an object. And I can go ahead and use is instance and say, is my class an object? It says yes. Okay. That means I could use a variable for my class. And if I were to go ahead and um, assign the variable x to my test class, I could then use x to create a new instance. And that instance would, in fact, be an, uh, an instance of my test class. Just use the variable as shorthand. And it's even true of modules. If I import the math module, I get an object. I get a module object that has the math module stuff in it. Um, and um, I can check and see, is, is my math module an object? Python says yes. 
Uh, that means that I can go ahead and use a variable there. Uh, and instead of saying math, I can explicitly put a variable on it uh, and use that the same way I would use the math name. Now, to be helpful, I decided I would translate this for those of you who only speak meme. Okay, uh, so, so that you can get the idea of the progression we've gone. I know it's an old meme, but you don't get to use this one much anymore, so I thought I would dig it out. Uh, basically, um, we're sort of starting from our, the Earth is in the center of the solar system view, getting down to a, a, a view that works specifically uh, then expanding that a little bit more, and then finally expanding it more to a system level. I guess actually the way that you would think about it in other terms is we're going from uh, an incomplete model that sort of kind of works sometimes, most of the time, but not all the time, to uh, a specific understanding. Okay, so we now understand why our list changed. Okay. Uh, then to uh, something that goes a little bit further. Wait a second, we can do more with these variables now. Uh, and finally, understanding how the whole thing fits in the system. So that's kind of the way I think of this progression. Um, or again, for those of you who speak meme. Um, so there we go. Uh, and why is this important? Why am I ta talking about this at a programming conference rather than a psychology conference? Because, of course, if you don't have a sound mental model, uh, you won't understand what your code is going to do. All right? I think we can agree that is a bad thing. Um, you can't predict what will happen. This makes um, testing and, and certainly debugging an adventure. We don't need that, all right? Um, as I used to tell my students years ago, you, there are many, many ways that you will get a headache in programming. Do not give yourself more headaches. Uh, so not having a correct mental model will give you a headache. And you know, it's, it's not just headaches, but in fact, um, I think increasingly, there is code that is you know, sort of critical in one way or another. Uh, I would hope that the people writing the software that is controlling uh, the airplane I get on have a sound mental model of the programming language they're using. Uh, the people who are writing the software controlling uh, a medical a device that is used on me, I hope they understand what the code is going to do. I hope, I hope very much. Um, being a programmer myself, I'm never totally certain of that, I will admit. Um, and it's also important because all of us teach others, uh, or pretty much almost all of us. That is, if you're doing a code review, you will be asked to, to comment to others. Uh, you, you may be asked to mentor. You may be working in a community program where you're, you're helping people learn to code. There are many cases where we're actually working with other people and we, we kind of have a responsibility to give them the best information we can. And of course, the other thing involves uh, the AI tools. Uh, this is something that I have to admit I have mixed emotions about. It's wonderful if they can save us things like Copilot or ChatGPT can save us some, some nasty work. I'm, I'm not against that, but I have to admit, I've been through enough things in, in the, oh, it's now uh, well over 30 years that I have been coding uh, that I'm, I'm sort of a little bit skeptical here. Uh, but it is true that, and, you know, and, I, and actually for the fourth edition of my book, I have to put in some stuff about these tools, so I'm, I'm reconciling myself to the inevitable. Uh, these will be used for code generation to generate tests. They will be used even for a certain amount of design and architecture. I'm sure of that. I have no doubt of that. Uh, so it's kind of important to have at least a mental model of what your code should be doing before you have the LLM write it. Because in fact, I don't believe many people have that great a mental model of exactly what uh, an LLM does. 
And interestingly, I asked ChatGPT, I asked ChatGPT two questions. First question was, tell me what a mental model is. And it gave me a wonderful answer. It was very similar to what I just told you. I was like, yes, this is, this is not bad at all. I then asked uh, uh, ChatGPT, so please give me a mental model for what an LLM like ChatGPT does. And this was kind of a disappointment because ChatGPT said, well, and okay, I'm simplifying a little, it said a little bit, but it came down to, well, it uses lots of math and stuff to predict things. Uh, and this doesn't help me at all. I don't, you know, what, what does that mean even? Uh, so um, I think, you know, the thing is, if you use an LLM to write your code, it doesn't have a mental model at all. It doesn't have a mental model for what Python is or how Python works. It doesn't have a mental model of what you want it to do. It is just giving you stuff that looks like it might be code. If you don't have a mental model and you use these tools, then we're in big trouble. Nobody knows what's going to happen. So what, what do I suggest we do in this situation? Well, the way I look at it, there are sort of three, three things that we can kind of go through here, three stages. So the first one is actually to, to be aware of what it is we've got and what it is that, that maybe is, is not working. So we need to actually think about what our mental models are. And this is the thing that I find very few people stop to think about. It's like, what, what is this actually doing? Um, why, why am I surprised when this happens? I shouldn't be surprised when this happens. Uh, you know, what, what seems like magic to me? And I, I know I've given various talks on how one feature or another of Python works, and people come up and go, oh, that's how that works. I never did understand why that was happening to me. Okay, that's a good clue that you need to think a little bit about what your mental models are. You need to do some more thinking. Uh, and the next step is you need to, if, if you have something that you think you don't understand, then maybe you need to, to make some simple predictions and test them. You know, just like I did with my x equals 2 and y equals x and all of that. They can be very simple experiments. You don't have to do them in production. You can just open uh, an interpreter and, and experiment a little bit. And of course, you can always uh, do some research and reading to try and figure out what people are saying. Um, I mean, for the workings of Python, I heartily recommend my friend Luciano Ramalho's uh, Fluent Python. It's got everything in there, absolutely everything. Uh, I know I should be recommending my book, but Luciano wins way over mine. Uh, he, it's, it's got everything in it. Um, but then once you have this idea, you can go back and you can try out this thing to make sure that the predictions you have now on a new mental model are actually still working correctly. And then finally, um, you can uh, do that last bunch of steps that I did in terms of, you can then think about how that fits in the rest of the stuff. Okay, so um, yeah, I know that variables are labels, but what does that mean in a wider context? What does that mean even uh, on the system context? How can I make that apply as part of my general understanding of the whole? All right? And, you know, I would, I would suggest if you're looking for starting points, uh, I have been teaching Python to people for now more than 20 years. Um, I would suggest that maybe you re-examine your mental models of classes. How do classes actually work? Have you played with that? Have you played with inheritance? Have you played with monkey patching? What's going on with classes? I find a lot of people are surprised when they actually start digging into that. Uh, same thing with functions. Uh, the fact that a function is an object, what does that mean? Uh, what implications does that have? For example, what does that mean for default parameters? Uh, generator functions, another good one. 
seems to me I think a lot of people don't understand some of the, 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 the slightly weird things that go on with those. So all of those are things that you can look at and more. I mean, your own experience may guide you in terms of what it is you want to poke around at. But I encourage you to think about that and say, hey, maybe I should understand this a little bit more. Because, again, it doesn't matter what tools we're using, whether it's AI or, or, or what it is, it doesn't matter what project we're doing, any of that stuff. Really, our solutions, our applications, our code, will only be as good as the mental models we use to construct it. So, that, in fact, is what I have to say. Uh, and thank you very much. <laughs>